All right, I am going to get us started here. Um, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Corey Ayanaji and I am the Ballantine Gallery Manager at the History Colorado Center and coordinator of VOSAs and Arte programming. Before we begin the program, I would like to acknowledge in the spirit of healing and education, we acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribes with historic ties to the state of Colorado. These tribes are our partners. We consult with them when we plan exhibits, collect, preserve, and interpret artifacts, and do archeological work and create educational programs. We recognize these indigenous peoples as the original inhabitants of this land. We are so delighted that you are here with us today. Bosas and Arte was created in partnership with the Latino Cultural Arts Center to coincide with History Colorado Center's newest exhibit, Echo in Colorado. For more information about the exhibit, check out the exhibit website, which I will put in the chat box below. Let's see. We're thrilled to bring together artists for a seven part series of conversations to talk about the importance of native Mexicano and Chicano art in the state of Colorado. But before we move on to introduction, I'd like to explain how this program is going to work digitally. The first thing I want to talk about is the chat box. This is where I will be sharing program resources like the link I just shared for the HO website. And um, I will also be taking questions and answers at the end of the show, which is where you can leave your comments again in the chat box. Um, if you have any tech questions, this is where you will put them. Some people might not see the dialogues, the dialog boxes the same on tablets and phones as on computers. So we will do our best to accommodate all devices. Um, and since I, I am seeing some more people sign on to the program, I just want to make sure that everyone is aware that we do have a live Spanish interpreter for the duration of this program. Everybody say hi to Gloria. Um, if you would like to use this service, please tap the interpretation icon and select Spanish and then select mute original sound. If you would like to go back to hearing the program in English, please select the interpretation icon again and then just click off. Do not select the English tab or you, you won't hear anything. And also, if you don't wanna hear the two tracks at the same time, when you're listening to the Spanish uh, interpretation, just click um, mute original sound and that can also be found under the interpretation icon. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the moderator of our program, Adriana Arbarca. Adriana is the founder of the Latino Cultural Arts Center. She was born and raised in Northwest Denver and holds a BA degree in Latin American studies from CU Boulder. After graduating, she worked in the arts in San Francisco for five years, including at the Mexican Museum and traveled extensively throughout the United States and Mexico to build her knowledge of cultural representation. Her parents started the Arbarca family the Abarca family collection as a way of supporting the work of artist friends in Colorado and Mexico. Adriana has added to the collection over the past 25 years and created the largest privately held collection in the region of art representing the lives and creative expressions of Chicanos, Mexicanos, and Latinos. She has partnered on exhibits with History Colorado, the Arvada Center, the Museo de las Americas, and the Emanuel Art Gallery at Auraria and supports programming at the Denver Art Museum. Currently, she is the exhibiting curator for the HO in Colorado exhibit, now on view at HO Colorado, uh, now on view at History Colorado in the Ballantine Gallery. Please welcome Adriana. Thank you, Kari, and thank you very much to History Colorado for sponsoring this event along with AARP. I also want to welcome the audience. Thank you for coming together with us this evening. So I'm going to give the biographies uh, of Cal Duran and David Osela Garcia, and then we'll have a conversation with them. Cal was born in 1988 in Thornton, Colorado, and grew up here. His mother was adopted, and unfortunately, his father was not in the picture. Cal is a self-taught artist who works, whose work explores the parallels between the myths and rituals among his familiar roots in India and the natives of the Americas. 
He employs ancient traditional processes to sculpt clay and paper into whimsical figures and installations. In his words, the makers of my blood flow through me. I channel the artisans, craft makers, mud dwellers, star makers, dream weavers, and earth brothers and sisters, the ones who have paved the way and forged the path. My work carries spirit, and my truth is everything I create. You can visit Kel at his studio at Recreative Denver, located within the Santa Fe Arts District. He recently completed a 10-week artist training program with the Latino Cultural Arts Center. David Garcia is also from uh, Colorado, born in 1977 here in Denver. He's accomplished across several mediums, including painting, sculpture, and murals. His work can be seen in public art commissions in both museums and private collections. David discovered his natural ability and passion for the fine art at the age of 11. His early work consisted of life drawing and water-based sculpture, which he created at the Art Student League of Denver. By the age of 18, David was assisting professional muralists and monumental bronze sculptors. Now his work ranges from large-scale interior and exterior murals, painted directly on existing surfaces, panels, cloth and canvas, as well as mosaic and sculpture. Through self-meditation and creative exploration, David has developed his unique technique and philosophy on painting and sculpture coined abstract imaginism. It is a style of art that combines the spontaneity and unpredictability of abstraction with the creativity and perception of his imagination. David is most influenced by the movement of atomic energy and its effect on all living things. It is through his art that David hopes to manifest beauty, inspiration, color, and energy. Garcia is an artist in residence with the Latino Cultural Arts Center. Now we'll begin our presentation. So we're gonna start our conversation having David tell us a little bit more about this bronze that he created. And uh, this is how I first met David actually with this sculpture that's part of um, the Abarca family collection. This was probably about 12 years ago and he was uh, exhibiting it at 910 Arts on Santa Fe Drive. Can you tell us, hi, hi David, and, and can you tell us a little bit more about this particular piece? Sure, um, this piece uh, is uh, it's a uh, uh, bronze piece uh, using the lost wax bronze technique. Um, this, uh, the title of it is Olin, and it's actually uh, kind of a creative interpretation of uh, the way I perceive water. So I had this kind of, creative kind of journey I took in creating this kind of mirror image like when you look into water and honestly it's one of my early pieces so I'm trying to really remember you know uh, what it was about and I love I love seeing it right now and um, I think it's really really significant because um, well for one because it's kind of a manifestation of what I like to do within my Mexican heritage uh, in regards to my passion for tribal kind of symbolism and um, imagery. So it's kind of a sculptural manifestation of my uh, passion for even Mayan uh, design and, and Mexican tribal design. But um, this piece, uh, I again, I'm looking at it really, and I'm like remembering all the things I, I went through while I was making it. But I met Adriana actually uh, during uh, the during the show where uh, I was showing this is one of my pieces that kind of really started our our um, friendship and um, and 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 so yeah I was really 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 excited about creating this piece in bronze and again it's Olin and my, my intention was the kind of the idea of water and 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 the really amazing thing that happened through through uh, through this piece is meeting Adriana and her father, Luisa Barca, and, and all the, you know, that's kind of the initiation of, of her collecting some of my work. And now we're going on to David's uh, Quetzalcoa, which is in the Echo Colorado exhibit. This is another uh, beautiful bronze example of David's uh, sculptural work. David, um, what, what 
really inspired you to do this piece? Um, I wanted to create uh, a serpent um, because of it's so uh, significant in, in uh, tribal culture, at least in the, in the Americas, you know, the serpent or at least in Mexico and South America, but Central America. So I wanted to create my own interpretation of a serpent, uh, the serpent kind of being this creature of the earth, symbol, symbolic for the earth and like uh, the duality of the sky and the earth. And so uh, I was actually really influenced by Mayan design on this piece. And so the, uh, this is a bronze piece, again, using the lost wax technique. And um, uh, this, the kind of the line work, I wanted to be, have this kind of graphic design feel. So I kind of developed these, uh, the, the texture on the, on the serpent itself, representing kind of like these, what we call grecas. Uh, and that's and that's on the body that kind of flows throughout the piece and then just influence in Mayan design in a way of their style of creating uh, kind of this kind of coil piece and and uh, I also wanted to kind of feel like it was almost like how rattlesnakes uh, the composition of a rattlesnake in a way of how it kind of coils up and then then it ha having this headdress you know like uh, so so having the feathers kind of coming off his head and and uh, very, I had lots of, uh, I was very inspired when I created this, this piece. How old were you when you first began working in bronze? Uh, I was probably 18 when I started learning about what bronze was and how to cast it and how to sculpt for bronze. Who yeah. were you working with at that time? Actually, I was working with uh, a, sculptor, a sculptor named Ed Dwight. And uh, that he's actually from my neighborhood. I grew up in Park Hill, and he's an African American sculptor. And one of his significant pieces that are actually, you know, he's very prolific in his work and all around the country. But one of his pieces that you might be familiar with was the uh, Martin Luther King sculpture at City Park. And now we have an example when you start. Uh, a sculpture, how you work it first in clay that I know that you make your own clay. Can you tell us a little bit more about this process and this piece? So in the technique I use, I use oil-based clay, which is the different than water-based clay where you fire and you use water. Oil-based clay is kind of self-sufficient. Uh, you don't really add anything into it to work, but uh, me particularly, because I like to explore the different possibilities of how the clay works for the shapes I want to make. I kind of add my own materials. So I'll add, so I kind of blend in waxes. Uh, and this is all a melting process, but I blend waxes with the actual clay base. Uh, the waxes have different hardnesses, so I can kind of uh, make it uh, really hard or really soft or whatever. And this helps me because my work has a lot of kind of defined shapes uh, that, that could potentially have a sharp edge. So I need the clay to hold that edge throughout the whole sculpting process. And so soft clays don't work well for me uh, because they will eventually lose an edge. So I would have to go backwards. And this just kind of self exploration and how I use this technique. This is my own kind of way of doing my sculpture. And, and this is a good example of kind of a rough, uh, sculptural piece that uh, I was composing with, with this figure. I love this image or this photograph because it shows your drawing process uh, in the background, how yeah. you really begin with a drawing and then yes. you go on to sculpt from that. Yes, the drawing is really critical because in the drawing I can explore some of the, for me, when I sculpt, I actually try to mimic my drawing my composition the movement in my line work in the drawing I try to achieve that in sculpture and that's kind of why you see the drawings back there but when I paint I actually do the opposite I try to make the drawing look more sculptural so the fact that I do both really has helped me uh, kind of explore the different possibilities but yeah that's my I always have all these drawings in the background that kind of show the different back side three quarter views and I and, and because I spin the work as I am working this thing is spinning and spinning and spinning till it's done so it spins until it's ready to be ready. <laughs>
And this is the final uh, product. Uh, I know that you are limiting your edition sizes in your sculptures. How many of this uh, Madre Tierra have you produced to date? Um, so the, yeah, I try to work in series, uh, traditionally in a series, you work in, uh, uh, in uh, traditionally in sculpture for cast uh, uh, bronze, you work in a series. So um, I haven't defined how the amount of series I want to make, but I probably have cast maybe like five of these pieces. I see uh, this scale of piece, you, the series probably goes to like uh, maybe 30 pieces uh, of this one piece. And um, I believe this piece is intended as a wall mount. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. This this is different. Uh, I always try to try different things in my work. Uh, this particular piece, because from my experience, uh, oftentimes um, you make a three-dimensional piece that they call tabletop pieces uh, that kind of exist in a, in the space, but. I've always loved pieces that you can hang on the wall because then you're not dealing with spatial uh, floor space and you have more wall space. So I designed it in a way that the actual sculpture kind of like recedes into the wall and it still exists as a 3D sculpture. So um, I, I like how it turned out, that concept. And I, and I have other drawings I think I've been working on and kind of explore this way of creating sculpture a little further. And how many pieces did you have to cast her in? How many separate parts before it all um, came together? I think she's probably, let's see, let's see, uh, one, two, three, four, five, probably like seven pieces, seven to eight pieces, because it's all in casting uh, bronze, it, you have to have a certain amount of like, uh, there's a certain ways you have to limit how things extend away from this piece. So then it has to be cut off. Uh, for example, uh, I think the hands are probably separate, the head separate, uh, pieces like that. And, and then it all comes back together when it's welded in the bronze uh, portion of, of the piece. So did you begin sculpting before you began painting or was yeah. it the other way around? No, I began sculpting first. Well, I mean, I, I, I began drawing first, actually drawing first. But then when I started to create my work, I started sculpting and that was interestingly in water-based clay, which I love because it's so organic. So that was in terracotta. And that was kind of uh, doing a live model, uh, uh, sculptural depictions from live models, nude models, or uh, a bus and things like that. It's amazing to see how the similarities between the sculpture we just looked at and this painting that you created a few years back. Uh, um, I know this was a commission for the Fiesta in the Plaza for Clinica Tepeyac. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit more about the subjects in this piece and why you chose these subjects to, uh, to depict a Fiesta Mexicana? <laughs> yeah, so La Fiesta Mexicana was very uh, exciting for me because since I was a kid, I would travel, or even take myself most of the time to uh, to the Civic Center Park for like Cinco de Mayo. I remember even on Santa Fe, they had uh, the Mexican independence. And I love, I've always loved people watching. And this is even before I realized I would use this for creating imagery. But uh, when I got the opportunity to create a scene it really made me feel like I had an opportunity to remember the things I see when I go to these festivals. So, so in this piece, you'll see, you know, people like having, enjoying their day, you know, uh, kind of together. So there's people eating, people dancing, you know, musicians. And if you look at some of the characters, you'll find that I try to give them a certain expression to kind of represent how they're feeling, you know, because these are all things that, in being at this festival is I look at and, it, and I actually take a lot of photos while I'm at these festivals and I just find it so fascinating. And that's kind of the, what I was trying to achieve was one, the, a composition that represented my style and color uh, and in movement, but also wanted to try to capture these people that uh, I've seen and, and try to give them life in, in a, uh, you know, two dimensional way. And, and so, 
Um, there's a lot going on in this piece by way of line work. It's, it's a bit busy in my style and um, I continue to explore the possibilities of my style. And so this is one of the, my explorations of how my style can work with the color and composition and then depicting a story. I should mention that this painting is also in the Echo and Colorado exhibit at History Colorado. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's, I, <clears throat> I can, uh, I still like to see this piece. <laughs> and now we're going to go on to speak with Cal Duran. Hi, Cal. Hola. Thank you, Thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah, gracias. So can you please tell us a little bit more about this ancestral totem that you created? Um, this is actually when I first um, really got introduced to your work. This, these uh, works were at the art gym in, um, on the border with Aurora. And I really took a liking to your totems and that's when I first began collecting your work. Can you tell us a little bit more about this exhibition, this installation? Uh, yeah, so this was about four years ago. I was 28 at the time. But um, these totems were created originally for the Denver Art Museum. I had worked on a collaboration called um, Mañanitas on, and we did, me and Danette Montoya did an installation on the fourth floor, um, activating the space um, uh, with the Mesoamerican collection. Um, and we had figured out these pieces um, to be a guardians. So in my work, I see a lot of visions from ancestors and um, kind of just follow spirit in that way. So um, the hands are kind of like the ancestors guiding our way and each face, so the whole thing is built in one piece um, with clay, and then I have to cut each individual piece and they all stack up onto each other. Um, but they're mostly like in the center is kind of a portal. So a portal of our ancestors and guardians and guides. And then on the sides um, are the guardians, the totems. And totems are really represent represent representational in, um, every culture. Um, so a lot of my work is cross-connectional, like between cultures. Um, so totems are really build communities together um, and represent everybody's ancestors and guides. And the butterflies to me are really um, spirit. Um, in a lot of, uh, especially in Mexican um, traditions, the butterflies are um, transformation. So um, yeah, and the art gym was a good place to kind of, it was a, called the mass show. That's where um, me and David kind of did our first um, show. Like we had a, um, our pieces together. Um, so yeah. Is that was, the first time, is that the first time you had met David? Um, yeah, actually, I think, was it the first time? No, he actually saw my work at Chalk. Um, and he actually reached out to me and wanted to like get to know me and was really empowered by my work. And then I saw his work and it just really kind of um, was meant to be. Cal, can you tell us a little bit more about this uh, piece? I know that you created this maybe two years ago mm -hmm. and I found this in your studio and fell in love with it. I think you also exhibited this piece, but I'm not sure where it was exhibited. Oh yeah, I exhibited this at um, Westwood um, up in uh, on Morrison Road in the Westwood district. Um, Frida Kahlo has always been an inspiration for me. Um, I remember just being enamored. I think I was like 10 and saw one of her books and was just rummaging through it. But this was mostly, I had this vision um, in a dream <laughs> and just of like this dress with all of the images of her life on it. And this side is actually two-sided. So there's another side, which is Frida as well. But um, yeah, it's just all of her paintings in one dress. And um, she has corn on her little necklace. But um, yeah, it was just really representing her life and who she was as kind of this embodiment of her, um, but yeah. And when did you first begin sculpting? Uh, high school, I was about 15 years old and the first sculpture I made fell on the ground <laughs> and <laughs> smashed and I tried to fix it. And then I was like, you know what? 
I'm gonna keep going. So yeah, just ever since then, um, my art teacher in high school kind of pushed me to enter galleries, to enter shows. So I was um, the youngest member of the Pirate Art Gallery at 17 years old. Um, and just, I could, always had a little kiln. I bought myself a little kiln um, when I was 18 and always had a little space in my house or always um, made sure I had a studio and just um, kept going. It's just what I, it's just my passion and kind of like my legacy at this point. You keep very beautiful detailed uh, journals with your drawings in them. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if your, your drawings inspire your sculptural uh, creations. Um, so honestly, I'm a little different than David in that way is I don't normally draw out my sculptures first. Um, I usually see them a clear vision in my head and I let the clay kind of um, do what it wants. And like, I feel a lot of my work is meant to, I do a lot of altar work. So a lot of my pieces invoke spirit. So I, I get a lot of ancestor. I feel like it's in my blood. So I just kind of let the clay speak in that way. But the drawings, yeah, they do influence a little bit of it. But drawing for me is more of a release. It's, um, yeah. Now we're uh, showing the famed uh, Casa Bonita <laughs> gorilla with the the headpiece. Uh, this is a, a wonderful creation of yours, and uh, I'm happy to have this in the Echo and Colorado exhibit and part of the collection. Can you tell us a little bit more about the creation of this piece? Yeah, so um, I saw um, a call for entry about the Casa Bonita. Um, they were doing a show, and uh, my early memories of Casa Bonita, we'd always go, and I remember the gorilla, he'd be like running around all crazy, like throwing chips. And <laughs> um, I just remember that vividly in my head. And this piece actually pushed me to, I was like, could I, could I actually sculpt a little Casa Bonita? Cause I don't normally do like building, like architectural work. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna try it. So. Yeah, and just like the spirit of Casa Bonita, I mean, it's always like a staple for me in Denver, growing up in Colorado, and just being um, little, I just remember it so vividly. So. I think it uh, really shows your whimsical side. Mm, yeah. I, I th people really, especially children, are completely drawn to this piece, and it brings back a lot of memories to a lot of people. So thank you for creating this. Wow. Yeah, and I like how, you know, clay and art can do that, that it could invoke memories, it could invoke feelings, it could bring you back, you know, to, I, I call it a time traveler, you know, art and sculpture and anything art related can travel you back to a moment in time. So now we're going to talk about Davi Garcia's mural. Um, David, if you can lead the conversation and then we welcome Kel's um, response mm -hmm. uh, to this image. And actually, sadly, to the disappearance of this image, you can tell mm -hmm. us a little bit more about that. <clears throat> yeah, um, thank you. Um, so this mural here is actually my very first uh, mural that I've ever created. Uh, I actually started creating like public, I guess, public publicly seen things at the street painting show in Denver before it was kind of what it is now, which is a pretty massive event uh, of a chalk painting. And I think this is kind of a manifestation as far as the colors. So if you notice, they're real kind of fluorescent colors because uh, that's kind of what I was using uh, is these chalk pastels to paint on the floor. And like, I think that's where I was feeling the, the vividness of the color and but I, for this, I actually used acrylic. And so um, this was actually for a building. Uh, uh, the building on 8th and Federal is the location, but it was for uh, Sisters of Color. Uh, and they were trying to create this plaza. They were calling it Plaza, uh, Plaza, sorry, Plaza Aslan. And so the idea is that we were going to cover this entire building with murals. Uh, and eventually got some degree of mural work painted on there. But this was the initial piece that we started with and um, this center, kind of a community center, really was uh, um, focused on kind of uh, native um, tradition 
specifically Mexican uh, in their kind of philosophy and healing. They really look towards native uh, healing and, and really embrace the Mexican native culture. And so I was actually in the same process of kind of learning about my own native culture. Uh, and so it was a, it was really kind of an interesting combination of working with uh, sisters of color and then in designing this piece. So our, uh, Huitzilopochtli is the, the hummingbird warrior. Uh, it's a, a native word in Nahuatl in the native Mexican language. And so this was very significant because I was trying to, uh, while I was exploring my own kind of heritage, I wanted to create something that was significant in that it was actually directional uh, when you talk about like the directions of the, the four directions uh, and things like that. So this was actually facing south which was the direction of Huitzilopochtli. So you'll see a lot of uh, symbolism in here pertaining to that di direction, like the hummingbird warrior and the, uh, the uh, Mikitsli, which is death, and then Tlaloc, which is the rain. And I combined all the elements like I do in my paintings to create some imagery that was hopefully inspirational and uplifting, but one of the one of the, I guess, real personal things that I did here is try to use my own, uh, actually the, the, the woman in the middle representing Coatlicue is actually my mother's face. And I wanted to honor her because when I thought about earth and like, you know, what grounds me was actually my own family, you know, my mother, very close to my mother. Um, and so I wanted to honor her that way. And, uh, and so actually, the figures and faces in this piece are actually family members. And so it was very personal to me, uh, this piece. And again, it's my first piece and just really, it was like really started my idea of mural painting and made me realize what that can be and how you can color it. And so sadly it recently got uh, painted over, uh, painted white, which was a really sad, for me, but also for many people that helped me paint this because this was kind of a community effort. And so it caused quite a bit of a stir in the, you know, in that uh, uh, community. And so uh, the first thing was, the first thing that came to my mind was like, I'm going to redo it. I'm going to repaint it because it's really important to me. And like, I don't care, you know, how I do it. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> and so um, to make a long story short, I talked to the people that supposedly uh, did this on accident and they're very sorry. They want everybody to know they're sorry and they're willing to uh, make it right. And so they want to, they want to um, fund the recreation of this mural and, and so that it, it has a new life back in the, in this community here. And so, um, uh, yeah, so I could talk um, a lot about this, but that's so yes. far what we're thinking. It, it did survive almost 14 years, and I think it's important for people to understand that this type of mural was intended to last for a long time because the community takes ownership of a mural like this. It's not like a crush mural that is only intended to last for one year. When it was created, it was created to represent our community and to help uphold and build our cultural identity and community really did take a ownership of it. So that's why it was not only very devastating to David, but devastating to our entire Chicano Mexicano community to lose this piece. Mm -hmm. So Cal, yeah. can you give us a little bit of, of your interpretation of this mural and what it meant to you as a local artist? Yeah, I remember always driving by this mural actually and just recently um, hearing that. I think especially there's so much spirit within this piece and I think as, um, you know, Denver changes and um, the um, gentrification of Denver, um, I think it's really important for neighborhoods to um, see the value and spirit that this piece for 14 years cultivated within the community. Like anybody that looked at this, it's, it's, a, it's a portal. For me, it's a portal to the other realms. <laughs> it's a portal to the ancestors to come through in and out, you know, to like universes. So it's like, and just to just paint it white and I get, you know, like accidents happen, but um, I think, 
neighborhoods, especially that are changing, need to be a little bit more proactive and research, you know, what this art means to the community as a culture, as a whole, spiritually and vibrationally. Um, but yeah. Now we're going to talk about the artistic collaboration between mm -hmm. David and Cal. And this image uh, was created for an outdoor sculpture museum in Minneapolis. Um, this is what you used as your submission. Unfortunately, you weren't able to create um, the larger uh, composition that you had hoped to. But can you tell us uh, both a little bit more about this collaboration and what it represents? Uh, yeah. Um, so this was initially so David kind of hit me up and was like, hey, man, we should do this. Um, it's the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden. Um, so um, it would originally have been 20 feet tall um, and the viewer could actually walk through the legs, but it was um, for the Dakota origin story. So it would honor the Dakota tribe. And it's actually the spirit tree. So it's um, almost like kind of, um, I'd say like almost, the, you know, woman holding up, like, kind of like Pachamama, but, you know, like the universe, like the mother tree, the grandmother, and all of the um, spirits and guides and guardians from the Lakota tribes, um, images were on the legs, and on the inside, we would have done the whole origin of uh, the story of the, um, the Dakota tribe, um, but yeah, do you have anything else? Yeah, this was interesting because, uh, in collaborating, we kind of uh, tried to work together. This is the first time we worked together and it was literally on the same piece. So um, uh, in putting this together, it was interesting, you know, kind of learn a little bit of how Cal works, which is uh, interestingly, it's almost the opposite of the way I work. <laughs> and I make fun of him because I was like, how do you do that? And because I, I work opposite, but in this piece, we try we work together, and we you know we try to put this together for this museum piece. And uh, I was real confident and like how we were composing this. And, and so, you know, we, you know, each of us kind of worked a little bit here and there. And, and I like Cal's like uh, style, and like it's very um, in, in, in intuitive. And so I, I like that. So it was kind of interesting for me to work with him and try to create a, even a model for uh for a project so we we had a lot of fun making it and it was you know the beginning of of, of our relationship and in, in trying to collaborate for creating art can you talk a little bit more about the commission the two of you received to for a room at the um, meow wolf complex oh yeah um so yeah it was a has it been like two almost three year kind of process um, since Meow initially came to Denver and kind of reached out to people um, for proposals. And um, yeah, so like kind of meeting um, David with um, that mass show and kind of filling our vibe. Um, and he kind of asked if we could be really cool to collab together, which was really um, inspiring for me because I look up to him, but also because I don't feel like I could have done a whole room um, at Meow Wolf um, by myself. Um, but yeah, we got a permanent room um, there, um, which is really exciting. It's kind of top secret, so we can't mm -hmm. talk much about it, but we are going to be kind of using similar um, uh, works, like in like ceramics and stuff like that, and kind of really touching on uh, honoring the indigenous community of Colorado um honoring um, the land um the ancestors the spirits um everything and really really um holding on to that um because i think it's important especially um with a big venue like that that we honor um the indigenous community and um ancestors and spirits so. and i'm very pleased to announce that david received uh, a commission to do the national western complex bridge and uh, um, I'm also excited to announce that he's going to be working with Cal to help complete that project. Um, David, can you give us a little bit more information about that particular project? The National Western Center? Yes. Yeah, so I received, uh, uh, I received, the, I was awarded the commission 
for the uh, National Western Center for um, uh, their signature public art piece. Uh, so this will be um, two bridges that flow in and out of the, the space there, the campus. Uh, they have lots of plans for the campus purpose. There's going to be a, 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 a college there having their one of their locations. There's going to be an equestrian center. Um, and you could look this up online. You can see all the things that they have in plans. And they're actually planning a lot of public pieces, too, of art there. But my, my uh, investment is going to be the bridges. And so it's a, it's a massive project. Uh, which I'm really excited about because it's probably been uh, uh, it's just a, an evolution of where I'm going with my work. And so um, the piece is going to involve a lot of mainly sculptural elements, uh, some mixed media in a way, and there's actually going to be a lot of uh, mosaic. Uh, I'm going to implement mosaic in color, sculpt sculptural mosaic basically is what I'm calling it. And so I'm so excited to see all those colors come alive in sculpture and um, I uh, am going to be working with, I am going to be basically finding artists that can help me uh, produce this piece as it's so massive. And so uh, Cal is definitely uh, on, on my list as far as someone I want to work with that has the experience I need to make this happen. So um, it's all very much in a, uh, the beginning stages right now, uh, but it'll, it's like I said, a few years of of work down the road. Uh, I'll probably get started, hopefully here in the next three months or so, I'll get started on that on that piece itself. Uh, and so in the meantime, the, your, your career is really taking off and you were just commissioned to do a new painting uh, entitled Freedom of Worship um, yeah. for History Colorado. Can you tell us a little bit more about the unveiling of that piece this Friday? Yeah. Yeah, so the unveiling of Freedom of Worship uh, uh, in my contribution, there's going to be four paintings unveil, uh, unveiled. Uh, I have one of them that I created. The other three are three other art, uh, Colorado artists. And so it's very uh, significant for me because I always, uh, I think I started looking at Rockwell's work a lot more when I met Leo Tanguma. Because <laughs> Leo Tanguma is really inspired by Rockwell, uh, Norman Rockwell. And I think he showed me a lot and I'm like, yeah, he is pretty good. He is good, you know, looking at his work. And so I'm actually really inspired by Norman Rockwell's technique and the way he can capture, you know, things. So anyway, I tried to, I had the freedom of worship was created by Norman Rockwell, um, I believe during World War II to kind of rally the, you, you know, the, the American people in, in this movement that they were trying to create. And so uh, this exhibit is actually going on right now at the Denver Art Museum, the actual paintings of Rockwell. But I was creating mine kind of in, uh, in speaking to this painting. So I try to recreate it in a way that um, uh, was kind of honoring his work, but trying to make it my own. So uh, I'm really excited about it because there's very influential people in my life that I depicted in this piece. So I'm really excited about that and again that's this Friday at 8 30 at uh, uh, Colorado History Museum. And let's go ahead and close out with asking Cal what's next on your on your plate. I know you mentioned that you're starting to do a lot of commissions. Uh, can you give us an idea of what type of commissions you're looking to uh, uh, draw? Oh yeah so I've been diving into a lot of um, making sculptures as altars. And um, this, I'm um, doing a lot of Santa Muertes and um, doing a lot of um, spiritual work and energy work and connecting further with Santa Muerte. But this piece actually is an altar itself. So it holds a candle, it holds water, it holds all the elements. Um, but I feel like as a whole, like this could go on your altar, um, but just really connecting to um, spirit in that way. So a lot of my pieces um, right now are altar related as sculptures. Um, so those are kind of the commissions I am getting um, and kind of working one-on-one -on -one with people, seeing what they want, um, what like ingredients they want in their sculpture. So yeah, kind of just high vibrational um, sculpture. 
Beautiful. And people can contact Cal at his uh, website or um, email, artbycal.com. Yeah. Gracias. Great. Thank you all so much for that wonderful conversation. I learned so much about your art. Um, I did want to mention if you all want to see David's piece, that is going to be a part of a greater History Colorado exhibit entitled American Democracy. And that is set to open uh, right before the election, September 14th. So you'll be able to see it at least until January 3rd of next year. Um, so now I just wanted to open up for questions and answers. Um, if you have any questions, just let me know in the chat box and I can call on you and you can ask your question to the artist or Adriana. If you don't feel comfortable talking on the mic, you can also just put it in the chat. Uh, while we're waiting for people to formulate their questions, I have a question. Mm -hmm. What is that piece behind you, Cal? <laughs> oh, this is a Guadalupe. So it's all made out of paper mache. I had made it for um, the Westwood show at, um, yeah, up in Westwood. Um, but yeah, um, I've been really inspired by Guadalupe my whole life. Um, and I think she kind of transcends time too, originally from, you know, the Aztec culture as to not seen and kind of like vibrationally moving um, and time traveling into other aspects of culture as well. There's always this motherly figure and I've always been enamored by it, so. Mm. Looks like we have a question here in the chat from Monica. Do you collaborate with other local artists? Uh, yeah, um, for sure. Collaboration for me um, is so important. I think it builds us all together um, as a community. Um, lately, you know, anybody that wants to learn clay or that I could learn from um, and what we can create, you know, together is just really transformative. I did like a three person collab. We made like a chiminea together <laughs> and that was interesting, you know, so it's it's very, and I feel like when we get possessive with art, it doesn't flow as well, you know? Like, we have gifts and we have blessings and we should share them with each other and who knows what we'll learn um, from one another, so. I know most recently, Cal has been working with Victor Escovedo. Mm -hmm. What are you two working on lately? Um, so we actually um, did a collab for a mural for, um, what was it, 30 West, 40 West. Um, we collab with that and we just kind of been um, doing clay and kind of, I'm an altar maker, so he's really into altars too. Just kind of um, learning techniques from each other that I may have not known. And yeah, and I have a kiln at my studio. So if anybody's like does clay and they need a kiln, like I do it, you know, really cheap or even for free. I know how hard it is. Um, so yeah, like we just have to be there for each other, supporting each other as artists. It's the biggest, biggest thing I think in our community and what's going to really build us up um, for the future. I have another question David, here. You, oh, oh, okay. Sorry, we, go ahead. David, do you want to respond to that question? The collaboration? Yes. Um, I'm, I think I, I'm, uh, I don't collaborate as much as Cal in a way because I'm kind of a, I, I'm like real, um, when I'm working, I was like, I like to be by myself and like, it's like, I don't want anyone to see it till it's done. <laughs> so I work in a strange way like that, but, but, but based on like, uh, but I do often collaborate a lot, but it's more spontaneous. So like, say I'm doing a mural uh, in California and people are walking by and they're like, man, I want to paint. And I'm like, yeah, let's paint because that's really the essence of creating, like, for example, public art. It's a lot of collaborative work. So, for example, the work I'm going to be doing in, in my next project with the National Western Center, that's a lot of collaboration. There's one uh, partner collaborator, which is uh, Piloto from Chicago. And he's got, we're going to be working a lot together uh, on this work. And so I don't, I, it, it, it's not as uh, open for me, like in my studio, for example. It's more of like when I'm on site or I'm working on a project, 
that becomes more, it's more like a natural that way for me to collaborate with certain people. Nice. We have another question here from Alfredo. What do you both hope that people will learn from visiting the HON Colorado exhibit? Uh, for me, I think seeing the history of Colorado, um, I was really enamored uh, about the wide range of the collection um, and being inspired. Um, there was some artists that have never been recognized um, that were amazing and held so much spirit in the work. And I think having those um, monumental pieces in the collection really uh, opened my eyes and really taught me how art is legacy and how, you know, um, when you put in those little seeds and you do the work and, you know, like it can transcend. So I think just the wide range of pieces and um, the generations that were in the collection um, learning from my, you know, um, the generations and what we can learn from each other. Because as a young artist in Denver, I mean, I've looked up to some of these artists mm -hmm. and seen their murals and been in shows with them and like to see my work with them too is really empowering. So. I think, um, I think one of the things you'll see at the show probably is just the level of, of uh, passion and technique that is put into these works. Uh, I've always been, I've always admired Adriana for her, her ability to see these types of, to see into the artwork beyond what, you know, any particular person could see. So I know that the work in there is uh, very, uh, very high level in technique and, and very powerful because of that. And, and, and I agree with what Cal was saying, it's probably going to show a lot of, uh, the diverse, the, the range of, of artists that exist here and that are amazing and the level of uh, the amount of amazing artists that we have here in Colorado. We have another question here from Gabriela. I really like each of your guys' work, but the work that you do together is so unique. How do you make it happen? Because you each have your own styles, how do you partner and maintain your unique styles? <laughs> that's a great question. Yeah, that's a question. <laughs> uh, for me, honestly, I think it's ancestral. Um, I think um, spirit kind of guides us to people, um, especially um, on a vibrational level. Um, and I think that kind of, um, when we dive in deep, like with our cultural roots, and we're kind of pulling the same imagery from things and kind of seeing, you know, like visions of the same things. And um, I think also sculpture um, and earth and clay has that, has that ability because it is one of the oldest uh, mediums mm -hmm. on, <laughs> you know, clay on this earth. And I think it has that ability to really like invoke spirit. Mm -hmm. So for me, like when I am working with Diva, David or we're talking like, ancestors always show up and I always feel it around me and I always feel this connection um, almost like I had done it before or and it just kind of flows and and just really being excited like he's always excited about stuff he's like oh it's gonna be so great you know like <laughs> so like amazing and then that ups my level and just being really open like not ha having an open heart about things and not being I think with collaborations like that is like being open being completely open and not holding this one idea in your head because it's gonna change. It's gonna like, we could have one idea and it's gonna elevate to a whole new idea, just like, you know, the universe and realm that's like, there's so many layers of things and we just have to kind of be open to that. Um, for, uh, for me, it's uh, actually, I don't think about how it would be difficult to work with any particular person or like even Cal, because one of the interesting things I've discovered about my style of work, uh, and this is kind of leaning towards the philosophy of my work, which is the abstract imaginism. I've learned that to go with, uh, it's kind of a, an a instinctual thing, uh, kind of a spontaneous thing. Uh, so it's almost an abstract way of thinking, which allows you to blend yourself into another artist mm -hmm. or vice versa. So I've been exploring this actually for a while 
uh, even at the Denver Art Museum, where I do these, I call them uh, interactive murals, where I let the, the public kind of be the vehicle, uh, be the, the, the conductors of this painting. And so I've explored this possibility within my style and actually I'm learning to use it. And so through that, I think I'm able to work with Cal in his style and how and figure out where does my style flow in this. And I'm actually pretty good at designing um, processes for art, creating art. And uh, I've been kind of exploring how our styles can work together. Uh, and so I've been doing different things, but mainly it's more like it really has to do with the way I work in my art, which allows me to work with Cal. Great. Thank you so much. It looks like we have reached our time, unfortunately. These are such great conversations. I don't want it to end. Um. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's not let it end. <laughs> I just want to say thank you all for attending today. We hope that this program has inspired you to come visit us at History Colorado when the time is right again. HO in Colorado is open to the public until January 10th of next year. Upcoming events, uh, we do have Cafe Citos every Friday at 9 a.m. The ticket cost includes a private tour of HO in Colorado with Adriana Arbarca and complimentary coffee and biscochitos and admission into the museum afterwards. I highly recommend that you sign up soon as tickets are selling fast. I will include a link below in the chat for you for those. Um, let's see. We also have our next Vosis and Arte Wednesday, August 26th at 6 p.m. with photographer Juan Fuentes and muralist Jolt. Again, that event is free just like this one, but it does require registration, which is also in the chat box. If you're interested in learning more about the history of Chicano, Mexicano, and Latino people in Colorado, we encourage you to make an appointment at our research center, which is located at the History Colorado Center in downtown Denver. Visitors can request to see artifacts and documents in our collection that are not on display free of charge. For more information on that, visit the Research Center's website. If you would like to learn more about our partners, the Latino Cultural Arts Center is on the verge of something truly special in the history of Denver that will elevate the artistic and intellectual contributions of the Latino and Chicano communities to a national level. They are developing a cultural campus across three locations in the Sun Valley and La Alma Park neighborhoods. Visit lcacdenver.org for more information. And lastly, if you like this program, please consider donating to support History Colorado so that we can make more programs like this in the future. Thank you all again for attending and thank you Adriana, Cal, and David for, engage, for the engaging conversations. Mm -hmm. And also a special thanks goes out to Gloria Lopez for graciously volunteering her interpretation service for the program. We hope to see you all at the next Bosis in Arte, August 26th. Hope you all gracias. have a good night. Gracias, gracias. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Thank you.